This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to the July edition of One Month to a Better Compliance Program. This month, we're going to focus on One Month to Better Internal Controls. This month's sponsor is Workiva, and first, I'd like to have a word from our sponsor. Thanks, Tom. Workiva delivers a modern internal control solution that connects risk and internal control information across the enterprise. The WS Cloud Platform is collaborative, powerful, and intuitive, and optimizes documentation, testing, approval, and reporting processes. The platform is proven to increase productivity and drive better decision-making and is used by more than 2,800 organizations worldwide for financial reporting and ICFR processes. To learn more, visit www.workiva.com. Over the next month, I'm going to explore several topics related to internal controls. We're going to take a look at what internal controls are and how they relate to a best practices compliance program. I'm going to help you understand how to design an internal controls regime for compliance, and then some of the specific internal controls for the functional disciplines within a corporate compliance program. We're going to take a look at the COSO 2013 framework around internal controls and explain how that integrates into your best practices compliance program. I think it'll be a fascinating uh, month for you. We'll certainly uh, explore the area of internal controls in depth. This podcast, One Month to a Better Compliance Program, is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Day 22. Today is the final day of my one-month series on one month more effective internal controls. And I thought today I would conclude this month's series by taking a look at some of the lessons and failures of internal controls. This came about largely because of the resolution of the Halliburton FCPA enforcement action by the Securities and Exchange Commission last week. And I think it provided an excellent example of what happens when internal controls are overridden or indeed not even followed by management of the company. The uh, Halliburton matter dealt with its business in Angola and uh, the contract with the national energy company Sonegal. Sonegal had a local content requirement, meaning that there had to be a local agent uh, utilized by Halliburton on any contracts for or to to uh, have contracts with Sonegal. So Halliburton had to have a local agent. This is not an uncommon situation in many uh, West African, Middle Eastern, or indeed Latin American co- countries. So it's something that, as a compliance officer, you certainly uh, could bump up against uh, fairly often. So Halliburton engaged in an attempt to find a local partner who would meet its requirements under what it terms or what it ca- categorized as a commercial agent. And this was in the 2000, late 2008 uh, time frame. And if uh, you recall, in December of 2008, Halliburton resolved its first FCPA issue around the Boney Island bribery scheme in Nigeria for $579 million. So the company was under a fair amount of pressure and certainly sensitive to bringing on any new commercial agents. A local agent was identified who'd been a prior Halliburton employee and in that work had developed relationships with Sonegal. This prior Halliburton employee had gone out on his own. And there was an attempt to utilize this uh, former employee as the local commercial agent. However, the proposed payment terms included a retroactive payment for work that had been secured under another contract. This was rejected by the first set of internal controls Additionally, outside legal counsel experienced in FCPA compliance and Halliburton in-house counsel had noted that the process to obtain a commercial agent status at Halliburton was long and difficult, uh, and but the board of directors had mandated a high level of review. So the internal controls around the commercial agent worked. The problem was the local business guys on the ground simply switched the agent from a commercial agent status to that of a supplier so the approval process would be easier. The proposed switch in this designation was that the Angolan agent would uh, provide real estate, maintenance, travel, and ground transportation services in uh, to Halliburton in Angola. Internal controls around this process also required a 
competitive bidding process that would take several months to do so. Overriding this internal control, the local business team was able to contract directly with the Angolan agent for these services in September of 2009 and later increase the contract price, all without the Angolan agent going through procurement internal controls. A second internal control was also overridden, which required an assessment of the critical criticality or the risk of material or services for a sole source supplier bid as this Angolan agent uh, was given that status. Additionally, the Angolan uh, 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 agent had to have a separate approval for any contract over $10,000 in a country with a high risk of corruption. And somehow this internal control was circumvented or overridden as well. It was then later deemed insufficient by Angolan, or excuse me, Sonegal officials, and Halliburton had to increase the payment once again to the local agent on the ground. And so there was a real estate maintenance contract provided to this local agent. However, in reviewing the contract at Halliburton's headquarters in the United States, it noted that um, one financial and accounting reviewer said he could not think of any legitimate reason to pay a local Angolan company um, more than it would cost Halliburton to run the company's entire real estate department in Angola. Uh, nevertheless, um, senior management at Halliburton overrode all of these and granted the contract to a single source with no competitive bidding. The problem was none of this was documented, and the internal control requires both identification and justification for overriding of internal controls. As a final failure of internal controls, internal audit was kept in the dark about the transactions, and its late 2010 yearly review did not examine them. So when you have internal controls predicated on providing information to an internal audit and there's an override of internal controls, you can have a failure of internal audit. So this was a situation where we had multiple failures of internal controls. This uh, demonstrates the thing or the topic that I really wanted to emphasize in this final podcast in this one month series, which is not only do you have to have internal controls, but they must be effective. And as a chief compliance officer, you have to not only test the effectiveness of those internal controls, but you have to also cross-test to verify that the information is accurate. And the final point that I brought up in the Halliburton case regarding the internal audit's role and its failure was because the internal controls had not told it that uh, the contract process for a third party hired by the company from the supply side had been circumvented or not followed. So you've got to have effective internal controls. Those internal controls must be tested, but you must verify that testing as well. We've seen numerous FCPA cases based upon the failures of internal controls, but I think this Halliburton case really points up uh, the need for effective internal controls and what you must do as a chief compliance officer to not only put an internal controls program in place, but also make them effective. And you must test that effectiveness, and then you must verify the data that you're getting back. I hope you have enjoyed this one-month series on internal controls. I certainly have enjoyed bringing it to you. The Internal controls regime as required under the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program and the federal sentencing guidelines, I think really lay out the basics of what you need to do. The COSO framework is the best framework I have seen for a compliance internal control regime. And so that's why I spent so much time on the COSO framework. I hope that uh, you will consider using that framework in your compliance regime going forward. Finally, if you've made it to this in the podcast, I'd like to offer you a map that I put together, which maps the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program to the COSO framework, the five objectives, 17 principles, and indeed all 84 points of focus. So this is the uh, most complete offering around. 
And if you will email me with a request for it, I will be happy to provide this to you for making it through to the end of this podcast. Tomorrow is August 1st, and I start a new podcast series. We're going to take a look at continuous improvement. I think you will find it a very illuminating one-month series. I'm going to focus on how you can improve your compliance program through a variety of techniques, uh, strategies, and inputs. It will be something that I think uh, every compliance practitioner can utilize going forward. This is Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist. I would like to thank you very much for listening to July's one-month series of One Month to a More Effective Compliance Program through More Effective Internal Controls. I hope you'll join me next month as well. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you again for listening to this episode of One Month to More Effective Internal Controls. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast, as it would help in our rankings and also get the word out about the only monthly podcast series, which will enable you to have a more complete, efficient, and effective compliance program. <laughs>